My, our next speaker is um, Bear Douglas. She is the Director of Developer Relations at Slack. And what we have now, what we're going to hear from, from Bear is um, how, how Slack um, d designs APIs. I think uh, in the API uh, scene generally, if you ask people who makes great APIs, uh, three names come up. It's uh, Stripe, Twilio, and and Slack. So we're going to hear now from from Bear how um, how how Slack builds uh, APIs and, and workflows. They eat what they cook, and uh, they make this available to uh, to us. So um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bear. Please welcome. Thank you so much for that very kind intro. Um, before I get started, you can hear me okay. And before yes. you leave, great. Um, so then. Ah. Oh boy, um, I'm so sorry. I need, it looks like in order to share my screen, I need to quit and come back. I will be right back. Okay, sure. All right, well, oh. while, you're, while you're gone, as soon, or, as soon as you can, you come, come straight back. Or did that work? That, uh, no, it's working now. So okay, fantastic. I'm going to leave you to it. Okay. Great, thanks, Beth. All right, hi everybody. My name is Bear and I lead the developer relations team over at Slack. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And I've been at Slack for about three and a half years. And in that time, I've seen the product and the platform evolve quite a bit. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about a brief history of Slack to contextualize how we build our product and our platform and how we think about the, the vision of the platform and what we're trying to get everyone to as they are working in, in their daily lives using Slack. So, um, for those of you who haven't used Slack, uh, it wasn't originally set up as a company to build Slack the product. It was originally a company called Tiny Spec that made a game called Glitch. And Glitch was a uh, multiplayer online cooperative game that unfortunately didn't work out as a product. But if you've ever seen a 404 page inside Slack, some of this uh, animation styling might be a bit familiar. That's where Glitch lives on. Um, so when Tiny Spec was building this game, they were split in offices among uh, San Francisco, New York, and Vancouver. And like many other companies, they needed a way to stay in contact. So in order to do that, they used good old IRC. Uh, and so IRC works pretty well. You can chat with people on your team, you divide up content into topic channels, um, but it doesn't have an archive. It's not particularly friendly to non-techies. Uh, you can't integrate other tools with it and so on. So the team had built some bots to try and work around those limitations. So as TinySpec was winding down as a company and everyone was looking for what they were going to do next, they all realized that they never wanted to work somewhere that didn't have access to those IRC bots that they had built. So they had thought a little bit about how they could make it work for other companies. And that is what eventually evolved into the Slack that we know and love today. Um, so we have a focus as a, as a company on features that enable great collaboration, a rich UI, and native support for multiple platforms among many other features. But you can still see some of the roots of IRC in Slack the product, like channels, uh, users and messages being the base of everything and so on. Um, but there's one feature in particular that is very IRC-like, which is these things we call slash commands. Um, in IRC, of course, all native platform commands start with a slash, and then it's a, it's a string after that. And we, we brought that over to Slack. Um, but we also made it so that integrations could, could introduce their own slash commands. It wasn't just things that were native to Slack. And this is something that is widely used among the apps and integrations that exist today inside Slack. Many of them use slash commands to, to kick them off. But while they're intuitive to engineers or people who had been using IRC in the past, they really aren't familiar to everyone. And so there are a lot of conventions in, in that IRC-based world that really changed the way that engineers got to work with each other. Chat ops was transformative in how people did things from incident management and DevOps. Um, and so the vision with both Slack and our platform was to make that type of workday possible for everyone. So one of the things that you see in IRC, in addition to the slash commands, are chat bots, bots that listen in channels and respond to certain commands. Uh, and a lot of early users of Slack really embraced chatbots and they would port them over from IRC or other services like Campfire, like HitChat. And so for many early commercial apps on Slack, like this is Poncho the weather bot, which uh, was a humorous 
bot that you could ask about the weather and also just chat with for fun. Um, all of the people who were familiar with this concept of slash commands and chatbots uh, had a really easy time navigating over to Slack. But because we have this vision with our platform of the connected workday for everyone, we knew that we had to change our approach in how we built our API and some of the endpoints that we created inside the client. So these days, Slack is used by lots of different teams. There are law firms, hospitals, and restaurants, and universities, and farms, all kinds of organizations that you may or may not expect using Slack to get their work done. So in order for everyone to be able to access the power of apps, we, we had to make some changes to our API and also how the platform appears inside Slack, the product. So I'm gonna tell you three quick stories about the ways that companies are doing that for employees who are, may or may not actually be engineers. So Vodafone is one of the world's largest multinational telecoms companies. We've got over 500 million customers worldwide and their DevOps team uses Slack to maintain an uptime. So they use PagerDuty and Datadog and a few custom built apps that they built themselves. And so they can monitor and escalate incidents to the right teams in Slack within milliseconds of an incident happening. And they've also built custom apps that integrate with AWS and other services. So engineers can spin up environments to production in about 30 seconds. And so they've been able to reduce mean time to resolution on incidents from up to 20 minutes to down to just five, which is incredibly impressive. And so that's, that's the, big transformation that we're so excited to see in DevOps teams. But it's not just DevOps teams that are benefiting. Uh, Hearst Magazines, uh, which is a has a portfolio of 25 brands with more than 2,500 pieces of content being created across them every single day. They needed a way, the, the whole publication team, to put data about that content and how it was performing online into the hands of employees and editors who could, who could do something about it. So they built an app called Hans, which is short for Hearst Answers, which can respond to questions in natural language, like what were the top performing stories on L yesterday? So that the fact that you can talk to Hans in plain language makes it accessible to non-technical employees and users can ask Hans things like what's trending, um, which stories Hearst brands have previously published on topics that are trending and so on and how each piece performed. So it's really easy to pull division-wide reports with a few keystrokes and publishers can figure out uh, which products and stories are generating the most e-commerce revenue. So all of that adds up to a ton of time saved because it's so easy to get this data at your fingertips. Um, they, they did the math and found that on average, it saves employees an hour a day to use Hanspot over their previous systems. And beyond that, the easy access to those analytics have allowed them to make better choices across their division. So they've nearly tripled their e-commerce revenue uh, from uh, articles cloned across brands since Hans was introduced. And that's that's pretty major. It's a, not an engineering team being able to make a real business impact and also change the way that they work because of this integration of apps and bots into their daily workflow. And so Hans was a, a big large scale project that's paying large scale dividends too for Hearst. But there's simple things that you can do even without development time that can have a big impact on how teams operate. Uh, DocuSign uh, revamped their new hire onboarding by creating a workflow in Slack. And that's a product that is inside paid versions of Slack that involves no code. Uh, this workflow, every time a new employee joined a channel, would show that new hire a list of locations where they could find documentation about their team and processes to get started so they could get up to speed quickly. And so the workflow also takes care of introducing those people to their new team. So it pops up a form that has questions like, what's a fun fact about you? And then it posts that answer to the team channel so everyone could get to know the new person and say hello. So setting this up through Workflow Builder takes just a few minutes, but it has substantially helped the DocuSign team onboard new employees and get them also connected with their teams faster. So this is really exciting for us because this was the vision that we had several years ago, that the, the chat ops ethos and practice could be accessible to other teams and to other industries. And we're starting to see that come true in the way that our customers have ended up building these awesome integrations. So we're seeing them build things for approving expenses, shipping software, managing retail stores, collecting payments, producing television shows and so on and so forth. But it took us a while to get to the point where customers could build that vision that, that we were so excited to see them do in the future. And so to get us to the point where customers could build these amazing things, 
we spent a lot of time listening to them and thinking through a couple of basic principles, namely that easy things should be easy, things that feel easy in Slack, and ambitious things should be possible. So for the first part, in order to make it possible for people to get more from Slack, you wanted to make things that feel like they should be easy, actually easy. And that first requires a definition of what feels like it should be easy in Slack. The first obvious thing is sending notifications. If Slack is a communications tool, when something happens that your team needs to know about and talk about, it helps to send it to Slack. So that should be easy. Notifying people in Slack should be a piece of cake. The next thing is rich data display. The basics like posting an image or a link should, to Slack should be very straightforward. And catching up in Slack shouldn't feel like reading a textbook. It should feel interactive and alive with interactive elements and, and images and so on. And in that line of thinking, we also needed basic interactivity to be simple. If I want to attach a confirm deny button to some sort of alert or notification, that also shouldn't be hard. So starting with that middle one, which is about rich data display, uh, we invested time early on in making our clients do the right thing by default when somebody posts a link into Slack, which is to say, if it's a publicly accessible URL, we go fetch the metadata on that URL for open graph or Twitter cards or whatever markup there might be, and we inflate that back in Slack. So that's easy, and there's no work required on the part of the developer aside from what they've already put on their web page. And if that link requires some sort of auth to view the content, like let's say it's uh, behind a login page because it's your internal company metrics, then you can actually choose to register an app where we will ping out to you when a link from a domain you've claimed has been shared. And then we'll, you can give the user an option to log in and then pass off the right unfurl to Slack. It's a little more work, but it's also very possible for all kinds of end users, technical or not, to get the value of apps and integrations right from that link unfurl. So that was one of the things we prioritized first. Going back to notifications, they were one of the most basic elements of working in Slack, receiving notifications. So one of the decisions that we made early on was to create some apps that we put in our app directory that could take care of all of the boilerplate code around setting up services to consume content from sources like an RSS feed and route it to a given Slack channel. So a non-technical end user could install something like the RSS app or a webhook app into their workspace, just feed it a URL, map it to a channel through a drop-down menu, and then they were off to the races. But many services don't publish through RSS. A lot of modern software tools use webhooks to publish events to other services. So we also wanted to invest time in making that super simple too. So that was one of the things that that we invested in early is making it dead, dead simple to add an incoming webhook notification into Slack. So nowadays in the Slack app dashboard, you can create an app and set up webhook URLs for particular channels. And because the last thing that I said in that easy things easy piece was basic interactivity, you can also pass in what we call message attachments, which are JSON describing UI that you want to display in Slack as part of the webhook payload. So in latter years, in the last year and a half, we've taken it one step further, which is by providing a GUI tool called the Block Kit Builder that helps you build that UI that you might want attached to your webhook payload. So in the Block Kit Builder, you can click on UI elements on the left-hand side to add them to the canvas that's in the middle, or you can direct edit the JSON that's on the right-hand side, and you'll see it all live update in the preview. You can even send this message to Slack to, to preview it live before setting up the webhook. So we wanted to make all of this super, super simple, no code involved, you can click to set up and so on. So then beyond that, in the Block Kit Builder, we made it even easier again by pre-designing some templates for really common UI patterns inside Slack. We can't expect that everyone is familiar with the UI patterns on our platform, the, the things that we offer. And so the more help that we could give people to create those well-designed apps, the better. So when you click this button that says use message template in the green, it will pre-populate the block kit builder window from the previous slide with the JSON you need to create this message. And if you want to share designs with your friends, you can copy and paste the block kit builder URL because the current view is always reflected in that URL. So we're making it super, super easy for people to share designs, to attach these things to webhooks and so on. So now setting up a webhook with some amount of well-designed interactivity is basically two or three layers of copy pasting. First, there's the post request copy paste from the app management dashboard, and then the second copy paste from the block kit builder. 
And our choices here about what tooling to build and what was worth investing time into making super, super simple was informed by the things that we already saw people doing in Slack. They wanted to consume event-based notifications from other services. And ideally they wanted to be able to do something with those notifications. There should be a notion of a next step. So I got this notification, now what? And so we put a lot of time and engineering effort into building the tooling and support that makes this so, so easy. And this constitutes a substantial bulk of the integrations that we see inside Slack today. It's the super easy, super powerful things that people are getting a lot of value out of, even though it's not something as, as complex and shiny as Hans, they're still getting the information they need and they're able to act on it. So that's what we early on optimized design around. So simple things, easy, or easy things, easy. But there's a catch. That was easy things, easy for developers and engineers. The thing about webhooks is that they're, they're conceptually straightforward, um, but the fact that they involve code is intimidating for a lot of people who aren't engineers or who don't work in tech. So one of our missions with the platform is to make this transformative power of apps and integrations that have been available to engineers for years available to everybody. So in order to make this accessible, not just for developers, we decided to invest in no code tooling in order to make it possible for people to be able to build these workflows. So in 2018, we acquired a company called Missions and they made a product inside Slack that helped you automate tasks that involve some amount of custom logic without writing code. And that product today is now incorporated into Slack into a tool we call Workflow Builder. And Workflow Builder was a super important acquisition for us because it does a great job of boiling down the, the logic of a workflow into a conceptual flow. There's no code to see. And so people can understand what they're setting up in a way that's very straightforward. Um, we introduced the concept of a trigger by making it concrete with specific actions right away. You can trigger a workflow when a person joins a channel, when they react to a message with an emoji, or if they click on the shortcuts button in the message composer. Um, you can also set up triggers that are time-based, so time of day or anything from a webhook as well. Um, so then once one of these has been triggered, users can add custom logic, again, through a clickable GUI that is inside the Slack client, not on an external web page in order to figure out what happens next, like sending a message or opening a form to capture more information. And this was what DocuSign was able to use to build their onboarding flow for new employees. It's just a matter of clicking out and filling out one of these forms and it's gotten them this result that's so powerful about getting new employees up to speed faster and, and getting them able to work. So, um, a lot of these use cases that we see are, some of them are engineering related, some of them are marketing and uh, customer service related. Some of them are, are just about em onboarding employees. And again, just like with a block kit builder, we knew that there would be people who needed help with some of the things like, what do I even do with this? Or what, do, um, what capabilities might it have? So we wanted to make it easier to use from the get-go by providing templates. So you can pick a template, customize it in your Slack workspace, and then publish it to the channel of your choice. And we published a bunch of templates to help out with remote work. So things from reminders to drink water and walk around, or collecting information to share between teammates who might be in different time zones from one another. Um, and so an interesting thing is that we provided templates from the beginning, but at the beginning, we published those template files on our help center with a .json extension. And it confused a lot of people uh, because we're like, what is this? Why was it have a .json extension? And so bringing the template library into the client directly um, and removing the need to download it and re-upload it, and then also changing the extension name to .workflow has helped people get over that hurdle. So it's about, we were thinking hard about how we can listen to the things that our customers are telling us they need or they don't get and how we can we smooth that ramp. Um, and we know that eventually people will get used to workflows and then be able to be ready to trigger them from other event services like via webhook. So bouncing them out to their developer to our developer site when they've been building a, a workflow in Slack doesn't really feel friendly. That's that's where you hit that that disjoint of wait, why am I in the developer site now? Why why can't I just keep doing everything in the client where I am? 
And so we're hoping we can flatten the learning curve a little bit by enabling all of this webhook setup directly in the client through Workflow Builder. So when we were thinking about building something that felt easy to use, there are a few things that we had to consider. The first was how many features to go to market with in the first release. Right now, there's no branching logic in Workflow Builder, and the initial set of possible triggers, like when somebody joins a channel or when you hit a webhook and so on, is fewer than 10. So we made that choice because we wanted that first release that people got to play with and, and interact with feel super simple and super, straight, super straightforward. When you think about easy to use, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, one of the things that we found early on with Workflow Builder was that understanding what felt intuitive or not about things like where workflows appeared inside Slack and for whom in one context was pretty hard. Because imagine you have a company of 100,000 people and let's say 5% of those people build a workflow for themselves. That's 5,000 workflows floating around somewhere in your Slack workspace. So how do you find the right one if everyone named theirs migrate task or, or something, something similar? So we made the decision that workflows should be tied to channels to help keep things neat and give people a way to find the things that they were looking for and not just sort of create workflows that would, that would be context-free and not associated with the channel. Um, and we had lots of things to work through with admins as well, like making sure that they had control and oversight over who in the organization could build workflows in the first place, and that everything Workflow Builder touched stayed compliant with security features like enterprise key management. So all of that goes into easy to use. And so it's it can really be quite hard to build. But the payoff that we've seen, which is that millions of custom workflows are getting used monthly, is, is very much worth it. So all of that was in the camp of easy things should be easy. But the, the people who built on our platform early on were constantly pushing us on UI innovation and things that they needed from the platform to build the apps that they wanted to build. So the other side of this is that ambitious things should be possible. So what do I mean? Uh, this is an app that the LA Times built in 2016 or 2017. And it's a tool that lets them publish stories directly from Slack um, and it integrates tightly with their CMS and their editor editorial workflows channels. So editors get a feed of new stories coming in and they can decide where on LA Times they should be published and then publish with a single click. And that's wild. This was totally transformative for editorial staff to be able to seamlessly chat with their team about stories that were coming in and then without leaving Slack, publish something directly to their website without mucking around with WordPress, no code pushes. And in time sensitive businesses like publishing the news, those minutes saved add up to make quite a big difference. So that is what I would call an ambitious app. And it had real transformational power for that team. They, they were able to really change the way they work and work more efficiently. And this was possible with all of the basics that our API, ha API had in 2017, which all they needed was a way to post channels, messages to channels, check, uh, basic buttons, which required an event-based API to deliver quick events, we needed message thread APIs and emoji reaction events for some of the other features in that LA Times app. So check, check, and check. And that was amazing to see. But there were other ambitious apps that were bumping up some constraints against some constraints in our API. So this is the SurveyMonkey app circa 2017. And at the time, it was one of our top examples of great UX inside Slack. So this GIF is showing you the experience of in a message inside Slack, picking a survey, then moving on to a task related to that survey, inviting collaborators, sharing results, collecting responses, and so on. And all this had to happen in the context of a message. So we, we provided a system called attachments, everything with that green bar on the side that could be ripped and replaced when necessary. So this whole user flow played out in the context of a single message. And oh my, I've got two minutes to go. So this is very difficult to follow. And one of the things that we learned, um, like with this early version of the Salesforce app, was that people were using ephemeral messages, messages that only appear to the user and then disappear to try and make some of that app flow not noisy in channel. So people wanted more. They were pushing us constantly on things like needing date pickers, um, wanting to hack together UI elements that we didn't offer, uh, or falling back to NLP when they couldn't get the UI to do what they wanted to it. They just want more space in the client to use. So that really pushed us on a bunch of different uh, updates to our API that we rolled into what we call the Slack app toolkit. So I'm gonna blow through this a little bit 
quickly, but we are going to go through a workshop where Kaz uh, on the, our DevRel team is going to show you how you can build something with the new UI elements we feature. The main ones that I want to call out is BlockKit, our new UI system that made it possible to take messages from something that looks like this to something a lot easier to read. Gives you lots more UI options that you can explore with the BlockKit builder. And um, we introduced a new surface area called modals, little pop-up windows inside Slack, basically because there are all of these UI flows that people were trying to do inside messages that just got onerous. But there was more space in a dedicated spot called the Home tab. And now you can, oh, we didn't play the GIF. We didn't play the GIF, but it's a much more cleaned up experience. So what we need to build to enable this was uh, a more robust set of UI elements. And this is all the things we've invested in in the last three years because we've, we've been pushed by the people who are building ambitious apps. We needed more robust UI elements and front-end code to make them work across clients. We had to silently publish those nearly uh, three or four months in advance so that most people would have a, a Slack client on their mobile phones that could use the, uh, use the new UI elements, uh, trigger events in our API, and a lot of educational material. So, um, we want to make this possible. Don't go alone. If you're interested in checking this out, come join us at the presentation later on, and we will uh, we will show you how to use this stuff. Thanks very much, Bear. I didn't actually want you to stop, but we. The good news is that, as as you mentioned, uh, there will be you, you, Kaz, your your team member is running a workshop uh, starting and uh, starting now in the workshop area on building an app in Slack. And so the people who've been inspired by uh, how you can do things within within Slack, uh, certainly that's um, a deeper dive because it's a 50 minute workshop on, on how to actually on how to actually build one. So thank you very much, Bear. Thank you for having me.